Our research is about donor conception. However, as part of the research project, I'm particularly interested in what happens if arrangements go wrong between donors and recipients. So I've been looking at a number of legal cases that have been in the papers of late. And in particular, I'm going to be looking at instances where it's a known donor and where what is donated is sperm. So what I'm going to be talking about doesn't affect anybody who's received donor gametes through a clinic. And it's actually quite different too for somebody who may have received an egg. The main problem is how much involvement should the donor have in the lives of a child or children that are subsequently born. This is the key issue. Very often couples get together when they're planning this and they may say, we want a donor who is going to be um, like an uncle or like a family friend or even a father figure. Now these are terms that are in everyday usage of course. But the problem can be that people have very different understandings of what an uncle does or should do or what a father figure means. What also seems to happen is that people's feelings change. In other words, once a child is born, notwithstanding the fact somebody said, I'll just be a father figure, they may feel quite differently about it when they actually see the baby. And life changes things as well. And sometimes people forget that there are grandparents involved as well. And they may want some kind of involvement. Or indeed, something may happen to somebody. A partner may die, for example. And then at that point, the idea of having a closer bond to a child who is your genetic child may arise. Unfortunately, although these are the sorts of events that life throws at one, it can feel like a betrayal. To what judges are coming round to thinking is that couples have a proper written contract. Now the idea of a written contract is quite important because it does actually allow you to think through whether you both do agree that somebody who's an uncle has stay in contact or not and you can sort that out at an early stage. What a contract will do is say five or ten years on when maybe conflict has, has, has occurred, it will tell the judge what you had in mind at the time that you were agreeing to this. But I do want to underline, it isn't going to necessarily be what a judge will decide should happen. What the judge is going to say is what's in the best interests of the child. So you can write a contract, but it isn't going to be legally binding in that form. It just shows what you intended. The other thing I think that this is really, really important to recognise is that no matter what you put in a contract, you can't, in English law, write the donor out of the whole deal. Because in English law, the sperm donor, if they're known, is basically the legal father of the child. So from our research, we've now spoken to a number of people who have had known donors, known sperm donors. Um, and it's been really interesting to see how what they expected at the time they made that decision, that joint decision, and how it panned out, how different that can be. And I want to give you a couple of examples from our research. There was a case where a lesbian couple, and they were civilly partnered, uh, had a gay male friend who agreed to donate sperm. He also said he didn't want to be particularly involved. He didn't want to be a father. He was fine donating sperm, but it wasn't his ambition in life to be a father. And so that was agreed. However, things did change. But what changed was that the donor's mother became seriously ill, in fact, terminally ill. And because this was her only grandchild and the only grandchild she was ever likely to know, she wanted to form a relationship with the child. So the couple introduced the infant to the grandmother, uh, the paternal grandmother, and it made the last few months of her life so much better. But in that process, the paternal grandfather also became involved in the life of the child. And when the grandmother died, the paternal grandfather wanted to maintain that relationship with the child. So somebody perhaps nobody had thought of, i.e. the donor's father, then became a very close grandfather to the child in this instance. This wasn't what the couple had ever imagined or anticipated. 
but luckily for them, they saw it as entirely positive because it was an additional grandfather for their son. The second case I'm going to refer to is slightly different. In this instance, it was a lesbian couple, and the person who agreed to donate sperm was the partner of one of their brothers. So he didn't want to be a father either. He wasn't interested in becoming a father. So he donated the sperm, and uh, one of the couples became pregnant, and she had a child. Unfortunately, her relationship broke down, and she was left in really difficult economic circumstances. And in that situation, what happened was her brother became much more involved in the life of the child. So it would never have been written into a contract. Nobody would have thought that, but actually it worked extremely well. So I think what we learn from the more sociological perspective is, even if you've got a contract, life changes things. You can't put things into a box, seal the lid down and say nothing will change. And the other thing I think too that one needs to recognise is that if you're thinking of the child, then it's a matter of should the child have these kinds of relationships as well. The courts are now saying that the lesbian mothers are the primary parents and the donor father is a secondary parent. The recognition that lesbian parents are primary parents does not, however, mean that the donor father isn't recognised by the courts. He's often seen to have a very, very important role, and the courts may well order extensive contact, stay in contact, allow the father to take the children on holiday and so on, depending, to some extent, on what has been built up over the years before. The conflicts that have ensued recently have been very, very hostile ones. And of course, we get to hear about the hostile ones because they go to court. But I don't want to end on a pessimistic note because certainly in our research and also in terms of just everyday knowledge, we know people make these arrangements and they work really well. So this isn't meant to be a, a way of saying, don't do these, this arrangement, don't enter into these contracts. They can work extremely well. But I think what we're learning from the research and from the cases that are going to court is you need to think very hard about entering into these contracts.